Well, I can hardly believe it's the last, the last round. Let's ask Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you, Lord, that tonight, my God, that this whole weekend, these three days, have been, Father, about your intention, your desire, to have us, Father, as a people that represent you well, that reflect who you really are, that carry your authority and your dominion. Father, who are large enough a heart from spirit to embrace a new era of greater kingdom conquest. And Father, we have heard your heartbeat. And Father, most here have put their hand up and said, Father, we, we want to be part of that. We really do. We, we want the privilege, the honor of serving you in this new era that lies before us. Now, Father, I pray that you will make very real, very, oh God, very clear the words that I speak tonight, Father, on your behalf. And Lord, that those words will be not words upon people's ears, but transformation of the heart. Let revelation take place. Father, we ask and give you alone the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I say it's not what we hear with these that changes our lives? It's what we hear with this. It has to be a work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has got to be invited by you. In fact, you could take a moment and just ask him, Holy Spirit, I'm here, talk to me. Because he actually really wants to uh, throughout this time together. Now, I, I just, this, this brother sitting right on the front here, I'm pointing at you rather rudely, but there you go. Get a little wave so you know who you are. Yes. Um, the phrase that came to my mind was this. The healing of bitter waters. I have no idea what your background, don't know where you come from, but don't know you, I'm sorry about that. But I see places that the Lord has allowed in the background of your life that desperately need the healing of his grace. And I believe the Lord is going to do something inside of you in such a way that it's going to unlock within you. It's like, like, like this urn of oil, like this vessel of oil, so that when you are reintroduced to those elements, the oil of grace and healing will flow out of you to them. Okay. Praise the Lord. Um, you know, well, better not get this wrong. Jody. Jody? Um, when you came up here to start speaking, um, I got this vivid picture of, of people uh, standing around this person that obviously was not well. And they were writing out various prescriptions to try and make them well. And it was like you were standing there and it was almost like you were annoyed. You were getting exasperated. You were going, for goodness sake. Um, because this person actually had this like, I'm trying to be gross, but it's like barbed wire. They, they had, uh, and, but because it had been there for so many years, the, the flesh had almost grown up over the top of it. And it wasn't really apparent, but it was there. And to you, it was as clear as a pike staff. You, you, Guy, can't you see? But they couldn't. And, and I felt the Lord say that God was going to give you eyes to see the real issue that holds people back. Uh, where, where others will say, you know, you should do something about that attitude. You should change that way of thinking. You should change that action. All the prescriptions, but you were, it's like the Lord would give you these eyes and say, here, yeah, but the real cause is. And that's a very 
That's a, that's a, it's like a gift of discernment, but it's more than that. That's seeing what he sees. Can I suggest to you that you adopt a prayer almost daily um, that I pray every day? Father, give me eyes to see what you see. Wow. Ears to hear what you hear right. and a heart to feel what you feel. I pray that most days of my life. I think it would be good. Okay. Um, the, the, the guy that was, where is he? Disappeared. No, he hasn't. He's down here. Your song leading tonight, your worship leading, right in the middle here. Um, I, I saw a vivid picture of you. And it, now I'm not saying this is, this could be figurative. It could be, a, you know, a parable type thing. It mightn't be an actual type thing, but I'm not going to apply it. I'm just going to give you the picture. But I saw you looking at this quite a f nice, clean, flash looking building with glass and stuff. No. Nah. Then you looked at another one. No. Nah. Another one. No. Nah. It's just no, nah, nothing. And then suddenly you saw this old thing that, you know, you, you're just, yeah, you've got to be kidding, you know. It's like something out of an Indiana Jones movie. It was like, it was, it was older and, you know, the dust was there and stuff like that. But inside, yes, there was a leaping inside. Yes, 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 yes. It wasn't logical. It wasn't reasonable. But it was like it was yes. And the transformation that then took place was remarkable. That's all I'm going to say. Um, you have no idea what you're saying some of the time. <laughs> Alive and well? Yep. I know this is a new era coming forth, and I've got to get into preaching the word. But for you two down there, uh, you, you, you've got glasses, short sleeve shirt. The lady that's on your left is leaning towards you, so I sincerely hope she's your wife. Uh, uh, okay. Give me a little wave if you think it might be you. Go on, dare to wave at me. Yeah, you, now you're looking at each other. <laughs> Just look at me. Yeah, right, God. Yeah. Uh, this might be a new era, like in church and all that. But it very specially is for you. And my word to you is this. Live life alert and unconditional in the next few months. I think Father's got a major surprise for you. And don't be overcautious about it. Don't overthink it. Don't think, got to be kidding, us. These sort of things don't happen to us. Well, this time they do. So, 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 so don't overthink it. Just grab it, all right? There won't be any confusion. You'll know exactly what it is the moment it arrives, all right? Thank you. All right. You're alive and well. Um, when I was preparing, I saw this long passageway. And at the end of this passage, actually there were several doors in this passageway, like the old Get Smart movie, you know, bang, bang, bang. There was quite a number of doors in the passageway. By the way, young lady, and I'm just pointing straight at you again, and you've got big round rings. Uh, um, <laughs> it's simply this, um, the Lord really does have your number. And you don't have to plead, you don't have to, it's like, that's all. I just felt the Lord say, can, can you just tell her that I really got a number? I'm on the case, like big time on the case, 
the last chapter is not yet written. And the next chapter looks pretty good. Um, I saw this long passageway with these doors in it, and at the end there was this major door, and this door opened up to reveal the most incredible land of the miraculous, of the supernatural, of miracles, of destinies fulfilled, promises coming to pass, the new era exploding. It, it was just the most fantastic looking thing, fruitfulness beyond measure, and I saw what was there, and it was really remarkable. But that was the last door. There were several doors between where I was looking and that door, and the Lord said that these are doors that you will walk through in the process of uh, pursuing that greater global conquest. And um, I, so I said, okay, and, and there'll be a variety of things. Do you know that in all of our lives, if we're real and honest, we go through seasons, isn't that right? You know, uh, springtime, uh, winter, you know, autumn, leaves fall off trees. We go through all sorts of stuff in life. Um, in Philippians chapter 4, um, uh, Paul spoke about this in verse 11, and he said this, Now, I, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. That's a great word, you know, whatever. Whatever, whatever. And I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere, in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then he comes to a conclusion, having done all of that and gone through all of these seasons and the variety and the, the amazing stuff that he did go through, if you read his life story, he, he says, I've come to a conclusion, I can do it all. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that, that doesn't matter about this, whatever, whatever. Whatever season, whatever event, whatever series of events, whatever, I can do it through Christ who empowers me. And, and friends, there are seasons, there's circumstances, challenges that come in our life, but I want to say this to you tonight, there is no circumstance, no challenge, no situation that can take from you your peace, your joy, your contentment, your excitement, your delight in life if you have the keys to those things in place. Now, I'm going to continue on that thought in a moment and tell you what something else about those keys. But as I was looking down this passageway, I was noticing that off to the left and off to the right, there were other doors. And these doors were not of evil things, the names on these doors. They weren't of evil things at all. They were distracting things. There were, there were things that would divert you from the singleness of focus and the driving towards the objective. And there were things like, did you know what? Do you know what I noticed about them? That they didn't have any keys ne necessary. You didn't have to unlock any of them. In fact, just the mere touch would spring them open. They, 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 they were so easy to open but they were a diversion. They diverted the person from the singleness of focus. And I saw some of those names. There were things like methods, systems, arrangements, finances, acceptance, position, achievement. Uh, not evil things at all. Things that are part of life. As long as they don't become things that consume you. Because they divert you. Their primary objective is to divert you and so they're diversions. But friends, we want to walk through the doors that God has appointed for us and we enter the new era of spiritual authority and kingdom that he's been talking about over these last two or three days. Amen. So when I was looking at these doors now, coming back to them, I noticed this, that there were all sorts of keys to these doors. 
And there was prayer. There was the word. There was faith. And there was there was um, fellowship. There, there was all our spiritual authority was a big key. And so there was all of these incredible keys to unlock these doors as we progress toward the goal and the new era God has for us. But then I noticed something which I've never seen before, and I've been preaching 50 years and I, nearly, and I have never seen this before. I thought, yes, of course, you've got the key of spiritual authority, you've got the key of humility, you've got the key of prayer, you've got the key of worship, you've got the key of the word. But then I noticed something, that each one of those doors had two keyholes. They had the keyhole for the right key, which was, you know, prayer, worship, word, whatever the key was in that situation, but they had another keyhole, and that was a much larger one. And unless the key went another key, there was a master key. I told you I'd tell you about that tonight. The master key. And I saw something that, that unless the master key was put in first, the other keys would just grunge and scratch and, and, and man, it had to be worked at and it was hard work and, and demanding and oh, exhausting and all of those things and the doors would open but oh brother, you would, you would need a rest at the other side of it. And yet when this key was inserted first, it was like all the other keys got coated with oil. And they just work effortlessly. Like, you know, just put them in and wow, and you are fresher on the other side of the door than you were before you went in. Does that sound good to you? Yes. Well, what is it? Well, it's your anointing of the Holy Spirit, of course. Well, yes, it is, but what allows that? What opens the door to release that fresh anointing and grant to us all those other keys and the anointing of the Spirit? What unlocks that to the individual? Well, I'll keep you dangling just for another few seconds. Because recently I was told by somebody um, in the health industry that there was a certain concoction that they'd got together in this bottle and I'm telling you now, it was the thing. Uh, you've got no idea what this thing could do for you. Uh, I mean, it would increase your health. It would renew vitality. It would sharpen your intellect. It would cure your ailments. It would reduce your blood pressure. If you believed the advertising, you would buy a truckload of it, and you would look forward to flying like Superman to your 105. It was pretty awesome stuff. Now... What have I told you that as a Christian here tonight, there actually was an ingredient that would release the anointing of the Holy Spirit, empower your prayer life, increase your intimacy with Father's heart, improve every human relationship, rescue your marriage, replace anxiety with hope, Relate, uh, replace doubt with faith, replace all striving with peace, replace insecurity with an unshakable confidence. It would accelerate your calling. It would release the miraculous. It would release spiritual authority and dominion. And it would propel you into the new era that God has for you individually and collectively. Would such a thing actually exist? Well, what if I told you that it not only existed, but it's not elusive and it's 100% available and you can step into it? If I told you that, would it not be worth the highest honor, the greatest pursuit, the most resolved decision to possess? Well, I believe it is. Friends, what's a master key? It's something called first love. After 49 years of this, I've come to that conclusion. The master key is first love. Now, what do I actually mean by that? Well, what I actually mean about that is this. 
when I, when I was wooing Margaret, 743 years ago, <laughs> no distance was too great, no time was too inconvenient, no cost was ever too great, no priority was worthy of consideration. I mean, I was a man on a mission. I was a man with a very single focus. You see, I was Lancelot, I was Galahad, I tell you, you have no idea. And I, 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 was, I was consumed. I thought about her at breakfast, I thought about her at work, I thought about her at lunch, I, I actually thought about her in church. And I even thought about it when the All Blacks were playing. <laughs> Why? I was in love. I was in love. And now, thanks to her book, Bulletproof Your Marriage, I'm still in love. <laughs> in fact, we're more in love now, 45 years later, than we've ever been in our lives. But let me tell you some things. We, we, love, we were in first love, but let me tell you some things. Were there times of storm and trial and tragedy? Yeah, you better believe it. Were, were there times of darkness? Were there times of weeping? Were there times of, of, of strain and contention when we completely lost sight of that first love and where, 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 the, where the focus just got all faded away and, we, and, and really lost sight of what really mattered? You better believe it. And you see, friends, there was times when there just had to be a very highly intentional decision to regain that first love. Because something about life and the doingness of life, doing life, will rob you of first love. But why did we keep renewing it? Because we were in covenant together. And so it is with our relationship with God, regardless of who you are, your calling or your ministry or vocation. Friends, we, before you were ever called to the vocation or whatever you do in life, you were first called as a son and you were called as a daughter by your loving father and you were called to live in a state of first love with him. That is your primary calling on planet earth. You, your, my primary calling is not as a prophet. It's as a son. To live in a state of first love and passion with my Father. And let me tell you something, friends. Without first love passion in your heart, prayer becomes religion. Church just becomes a discipline. Righteousness becomes a frustration. Compassion becomes a sacrifice. The pursuit of your calling becomes sheer hard work. But first love turns those things into a joyous pursuit. It energizes you. It floods your heart with delight and privilege and, and anticipation and expectation. There's something about that you live for. Uh, listen, when I was dating Margaret, I, I might have had a whole day at the office where I was working as a as a legal executive or whatever, and, and just worn out, tired out with people and mongrel and everything happening. You know what? But I'll tell you something, driving to her place, the closer I got, what, the more, the, look, the eyeballs lit up again. <laughs> they used to say about me, well, this is a long time ago, um, He's the only guy alive that just cannot take one step at a time. He has to take three steps at a time. And, and they said, where did that start with you? You even run through a shopping mall. Can you not do anything other than full speed? And, and they said, where did you get that? Well, you see, I got that when I was courting. I, I, I just think of Margaret. And, you know, why take one step at a time if I could take three when she's waiting on the inside? And so, 
and somehow the, 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 the doableness of working in a day, it didn't matter anymore. I was about to see my first love. I want to turn to Revelation chapter 2. Verse 1. This is, a, this is a bunch of verses here that have so been misunderstood. Okay, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1 says, to the angel, of, uh, I don't read past wherever it is I'm reading, that'll be good. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's what he says to the church of Ephesus. Verse 2, I mean, this is awesome. I know your works, I know your labor. I know your patience. Hey, friends, these are all godly attributes. And that you can't bear those who are evil. So they've got a commitment to holiness and righteousness and truth. And you've tested those who are apostles and are not. And you've found them to be liars. So they, they possess great discernment. And verse 3, you have persevered and you've had patience. Man alive, godly endurance. And you've labored for my name's sake, and you've not become weary. There's a steadfastness about them. I want you to understand that this scripture has been misquoted. These people are God's champions. Read the list. God is gloating over them. God is celebrating this people. You're, you've got patience. You love righteousness. You, you've tested those who are not. You've persevered. You've patience. You've not become weary. He's championing these people. And then he goes to verse 4. Nevertheless. So he doesn't discount any of that. He says, nevertheless. I have this against you that you've left your first love. Verse 5, remember therefore from when you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I'll come to you quickly, remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Whoa, wait, hold it. In the middle of all this affirmation, in the middle of all this commendation and this great stuff, he uses a word like repent. I said, Father, and he said, yeah, but understand what I was saying. I looked the word up. It means to acknowledge your condition. Turn around and re-embrace and head again in the right direction. Friends, it, mean, it does not mean to grovel. It does not mean to present yourself with ashes on your head and crawl on your knees in brokenness for a month. It does not mean that. It means to acknowledge what has happened and re-embrace where it should be. Put it right. And immediately after saying that, he goes, verse 6, we go right on back to commending them. Verse 6, but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate, so we're one, one accord on that. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life. Life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So let's get what the Scriptures actually say. Because he's not, he's not donging this church. He say, what he's saying to this church is, <laughs> you're incredible, you're awesome, your perseverance, your discernment, your love for righteousness, all of that, it is so cool. But he's saying here, you, you, you've, you've lost your, your first love there, but if you can regain it, if you can regain it, if you can repossess it, you'll eat of the tree of life, life. And, and this is a reference to where Jesus says, I come that you might have life. I come that you might have life and that more abundantly. 
And friends, the word abundant is like this irrepressible bubbling up, this incredible, uh, unstoppable well of nuclear energy blasting out from within you. Life. He's not talking about existence. He's not talking about discipline. He's not talking about religious endeavor. He's actually talking about life. You, you get in contact with some people, you know, and you, and you feel like they're swallowed an ever-ready battery. They're just, you know, and his life is just coming out of them. And Jesus was saying that, that there was something available to us that would so energize us in life that, that, we'd, we, that it didn't have to be work anymore. It didn't have to be a gritting of the teeth anymore. It didn't have to be a holy discipline even anymore. It had to be life. We're alive and well. You see, it's all yours. It's all yours if we can best overcome the gravitational pull to make it work, to get diverted, distracted, to have it drain out of us. And before long, we wake up one morning and realize that religious pursuit has replaced the passion of first love. When we first came to Jesus Christ, I don't know what it was like with you, but the majority of us were initially overwhelmed at the sheer wonder of what had taken place. I mean, sin's grip on us and it was now broken. We'd been taken out from darkness and placed into light. We'd been forgiven. We'd been embraced by a loving Heavenly Father. The Holy Spirit had been imparted to us. Wow, we were grateful. We were passionate. We were zealous. I remember when I first got filled with the Holy Ghost, I really thought I was indestructible. I could do absolutely anything. And I remember being on the streets of Ponsonby, and I just grabbed this box, and I just stand up in this box and start preaching away. And I mean, everybody thought I was nuts, but it didn't matter. It really didn't matter. And so that didn't work, so we got a tent, and I put up a found a p- 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 in Ponsonby. I was a, you're probably not allowed to do it now. But we, we put up this tent, and man, I'd preach night after night in this tent. There sometimes there was nobody there at all, but sometimes there was two or three, and it didn't matter. I was in first love. <laughs> you see, no cost was too great. Nothing was too great. You didn't hold me here. See, we're grateful. For, uh, we were empowered by a holy sense of privilege and passion and zeal that gripped a hold of our hearts. We, it wasn't a matter of having to do anything. It's called a state of first love. And friends, the grip thing that grips me tonight is that the church of Ephesus was a great, great church. But it had suffered from the, both the predictability and the momentum of doing. Did you get that? The predictability and the momentum of doing, but without the passion of first love. And I, now I love the passion in this house, so don't get me wrong here, but I travel a lot. I go to a lot of cities and nations, and I, and, and I have seen congregation after congregation after congregation in the Western world where although they're growing numerically wonderfully and powerfully and lots of great stuff is happening, the truth of the matter is that the average person in the pew is l- virtually powerless on a day-to-day basis, and a lot of hard work, a lot of people getting tired, a lot of people getting uh, under the strain of things and, and trying to do what's right, and, 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 and it's like God is saying, why have they made such hard work out of something that was supposed to be life? It was supposed to be a pulsating, incredible relationship with a father that loves you to bits, and you're supposed to walk around listening to his voice and then get empowered by what he says and just rushing out to do whatever it is he put in your heart to do. It's called first love. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. Ah, but recall the former days in which after you first illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, and you know what? You didn't care. Partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly because you became companions of those who were so treated. You know what? 
He didn't care. No price was too great. It didn't matter. For you had compassion on me in my change. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing you had that you had a better and a more enduring possession for yourself in heaven. Filled with compassion, joy, celebration, overcoming of spirit, and you couldn't have cared a hoot about keeping up with the Joneses. And then it goes on to say, therefore do not cast away now that confidence, which now has got such, such reward, great reward, for you have need of endurance, that after you've done the will of God, notice you may receive the promise. Lots of people doing the will of God right now. People, hear me so you don't misunderstand me. A lot of people doing the will of God. God's pleased them. God was pleased in the church of Ezra. They're doing the will of God. But, it, but what he's saying here is that after you've done the will of God, that you might receive the promise. When I look ahead and see what God has in store for this church, the church is only people. It's you. And so when I look ahead and see what God has for you, now don't look at the person next to you, you. When I feel what my Father has in store for you, for every one of you, I know that he has provided everything you need to possess that. Everything is already supplied. He doesn't have to supply anything. He's already supplied it all ahead of time. But the way you will possess it, and a year from now, be bubbling over with life, is if you rediscover, repossess, and walk in first love. I'm talking about passion. I'm talking about abandonment. I'm talking about where nothing else ever matters. I'm talking about that surrender factor I talked about this morning where it doesn't matter who thinks about what about you. Do you know what? Do you know how liberating it is not to care a hoot what they think about you? My father loves me. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm grateful for everybody else, but my father loves me. And I love him. And every single day of my life is one that he has pre-thought, pre-planned, pre-provided for. And what I've got to do is wake up in the morning and get ready to possess the day that he's already given me. And it's got, it's got nothing... It's got nothing to do with the nature of the circumstance. It's got nothing to do with the nature of the opposition. <laughs> if only we could see ourselves as he already does. You know, every demon in hell cringes in terror when you walk into the room. And the first thing that occurs to them is, I hope this one doesn't know who they are. And they will see it in your eyes. Tonight's all about rediscovering and saying, Father, I want to live in first love where nothing else matters. Where nothing else matters, it's me and thee, Lord. I want to live in the passion of first love. Can we just bow our heads in a word of prayer, please? I'm just going to right now, I'm just going to say this right out front. Because I look back on my own life and I knew the time after time after time after time after time when I have had to suddenly stop and take stock. No condemnation there whatsoever. I just took stock and said, hey, hey, what happened to the passion? What happened to the first love? What happened to that life energy thing? I need a fresh revelation of my father's love. I need a fresh revelation of who I am. I need a fresh revelation 
that will unlock my first love again. That I can run through life. If you want that, then he wants it more than you do. If you want that and you feel that something has taken away from that and life has become a little bit more of a discipline than a delight in some area, you're faithful, you're godly, you're diligent, not questioning any of that stuff. But that first love passion, oh God, I want that first love passion back. If that's you, why don't you stand to your feet now and say, Father, count me in on this. I'm, I'm, I'm available. I'm available. Don't stand because others are. You stand because that's what you're saying on the inside. <laughs> Wake up every single morning of your life bathing in your Father's love. Father, I pray for every single person standing before you right now. Oh, Father, your love for us is indescribable. Your acceptance of us is unconditional. Father, right now, tonight, tomorrow morning, the next day, the next day, the next day, Father, as each one presents himself before you, I am believing that the Holy Spirit will visit them. Oh, that they would see clearly, Father, your incredible love for them, and they would unlock their great love for you. And Lord, a new passion will flow through them and will affect the one to their left and their right and before and behind. And Father, that there will be a wave of passion that rises up in the heart of this church. And my God will spill over onto the streets of this city. And Lord will spill over into the corridors and the highways of this nation and the nations of the world. It will be a tsunami of your redemptive love pouring out of the souls of men and women who really know who they are. Oh, let your first love passion, Lord, be an uncontainable energy of life. And it all starts, Father, with your unconditional acceptance, your indescribable love. Let it settle in each one tonight as they go their way. In Jesus' mighty name. Can everybody say amen? amen? It's been awesome to be with you these few days. I've loved it. I will be, I, I will be, I will be listening so keenly. I, I will have my ear to the ground because I'm expecting extraordinary things to come out of who you are. Over the next few years, the, the, the things that God has in store for every single one of you is indescribable. Don't overthink it. Grab it. Possess it. Lord bless you. Don't forget the resources. I'm not going to spend more time on it. But there's USBs. There's books out there. There's DVD collections. There's all sorts of stuff. But I know it will empower you to run the race well. God bless you. Okay, Jesus.